We're back, everybody, and we're talking about The Dark Forest, the second book in the Remembrance of Earth's Past series, or, as it's most commonly known, the Three Body Problem series. If you didn't watch our discussion of the first book in the series, and I say watch, I mean listen, go back. To, watch it with your ears. Watch it with your ears. Go back two podcasts ago where we talked about a lot of broader themes as well as the first book. If you haven't read the books, I would recommend reading the books before listening to us spoil everything for you, but it's your life. Do what you want. As always, I'm Mark. Here with me is Matt. Hey. And Orion. Hello. So let's talk about The Dark Forest. I know Orion mentioned it a second ago. I don't remember what your opinion was, Matt, but this was my favorite, I think, of the three. Yeah, same for me. I mean, I think they're all fantastic, but this was just just a, that half step above. Yeah, which is apparently the reputation is that this is the least liked book of the three. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for, for me, the first book is my favorite. This book is exceptional. It's hard to really put them on tears. Mm -hmm. we'll, I'm sure we'll get into this, the differences in style and things like that. But I think there's a lot of room for different kind of readers to like different ones more yeah i one thing to note is that the translator changes between the first two so the same person translates the second and third book but a, a different person was on the first okay and i think that's noticeable i think the translator really? i'm I, let me double check now it, no you're correct on it changing oh okay i just didn't notice it yeah. i think i noticed it in that the language seemed a bit more flowery is not the right word. I, I think the translator was a little bit less literal in the second and third books. It would be my guess. The third it book seemed... is translated by the same person as Three Body, the first book. Oh, really? It, it's Dark It's dark Forest that has a different translator, yeah. Huh. Personally, I think that the differences in the second book are due to the author not the the translator yeah I, I don't know i felt like the the language was less stilted in the second book Whereas yeah but that's first very book, much i think that's very much a product of the story and probably the way that it was uh, meant to be told i think oh i thought it would be a product of chinese grammar which as i understand it is terse yeah that's a good word as, as I understand it, I don't really have a lot of knowledge in it. He but says it's, tersely. So yeah, no, we, you're generally right. Okay. I don't know the details of that. Yeah. So are we just straight back into spoiler territory? Yeah, let's jump into spoiler territory, give a warning. Okay, uh, spoilers. Suppose. Warning, warning. You've already been spoiled last week if you yeah. listened. Here you go. Aliens are invading Earth. Ah! Yes, aliens are coming. Early on, we find out it's 400 years, right? Or about 400 years. We, we already years. kind of knew, yeah. but it's confirmed. So, okay, let me just talk, like, why I love this book so much. Yes. First of all, when you get to the Dark Forest, I'm going to go in reverse. The end of this book is has, amazing. has just some of the most incredible, like, soul-wrenching scenes and decisions that people make. And it's got to be the most thematic if not, if not, it's like top three for sure. Like the droplet encounter battle is. Oh, you be mean the most, like, like spectacular? Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. yeah. Cinematic. Cinematic. This Cinematic. is yes, um, absolutely. Just this incredible. this book as a movie would even if he just did this book as a movie and didn't do the first and third, it would be an incredible movie. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because the first book would be an incredible movie, and you could do it as a low budget sci fi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you could. And this would be an incredible movie, but you'd want a two hundred million dollar budget. <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd the third wanted... movie you would be could be almost entirely CGI. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For this one, you definitely want the you know the the interstellar budget, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whatever computers they used to do that movie. <laughs> okay, so and yeah, just like go in reverse, these in incredible scenes, the battle of darkness. Oh my god, like. Is there a more just like despair Nietzsche ish sequence of decisions? It's yeah. It's like it's heavy. It's so heavy. Well it's the ultimate like human hubris like Well it's it's not that. It's the we have to survive in the dark 
for the rest of our lives. Right, yeah. And there's no one coming to help, and there's not enough supplies, and there's nowhere to go. Yeah. And we're going to cannibalize each other yeah. to survive a little bit longer. There's the droplet encounter, which that's the pinnacle <laughs> of hubris. If you want to talk about hubris. Right, that's, that's the, the one I would thought you were hubris. referring to. Yeah, yeah. No, the Battle of Darkness is where they the kill each other. The two ships, yeah. The, the two groups of ships, yeah. yeah. The other really big thing is just the contrast between like the first half of the book, like the the attitude of society in the first half of the book versus the second half of the book. Yes. Uh, or like the second third the third quarter of the book <laughs> and then once once you learn the history of everything that happened with like the the wall facer insanity which i think is brilliant uh, as a storytelling like mm-hmm. device and we'll hit that again and then they like everything collapses and everyone it, it all goes into this crazy military budget they strip the planet society falls apart great ravine and then <laughs> everyone decides that no we have to just kind of you know, we can work together again. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let, and, let, and, let's try to rein this in. Orion, you're doing a great job of, of talking about just the, the scope of this. The second book is really where the scope explodes. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's just incredible the scale at which in time and space, which these books take place. Yeah. yeah. Book, and it's um, something I read maybe like 40, 50 years total yeah total including flashbacks yeah this one's over at least 200 at least 250 years yeah well and it's something i believe i read in the postscript of the first book there's a there's a little essay by the author at the beginning or end of one of the books and he's he's talking about what made him love sci-fi and he said the scale of it and the the way it communicates scope and immensity was what he loves about sci-fi and this is where you start to really see that in his writing yeah to a massive degree i mean he does it it seems big in the in the three body problem but once you've read all three looking back that one like the problems in that book seem so quaint yeah <laughs> Compared... quaint is a great way to say it. it's this quaint little scientist story yeah and then, it's a couple of scientists and their struggles. <laughs> and then as we talked about last time, there's a constant theme where the the people who are making big decisions or humanity, you could say, consistently over or underestimates things by absurd degrees. And we do as well in sometimes different ways where something huge on a literary level tend, looks ends up being very insignificant which i guess leads us into mm-hmm. the wall facers man what a what an insane idea <laughs> which is such a cool setup for a story yeah humanity is faced with the problem of the aliens are coming we can't fight them and they have invisible undetectable spies everywhere that is monitoring all con- all conversation and communication essentially and we know that they're much more powerful than us because they made those things right and they can travel Uh, and and we can't advance our science and they can basically read our mail so what do we do we we have to survive right Uh, you know it's built into your dna to survive and so they come up with this realization that the only place that is actually secret on earth is the human mind and so they designate four people to be wall facers which the imagery is that is it that they're staring at a wall or that they are a wall that doesn't give any information i thought it was the idea that they're just sitting in contemplation anyways the the idea is that they are given unlimited budget and power well they're told it's unlimited (laughs) yeah well right uh but their charter is to basically come up with a plan entirely in their own mind of how to defend earth against trisolaris and then execute it in a disguised way, and they have, they're told, the full resources at Earth, of Earth at their disposal. And they, can, they cannot explain their plan, because then it's not secret anymore. Right. Yeah, and, and there's this catch-22 in that once the wall facer, facer project is initiated, anything that these people do could be a part of their plan. So, so they can like, never quit. <laughs> They can never quit. And, and our main character tries to quit right off the bat. Yeah, he's such an interesting character. Luo, it, Luo it, Zhi. It, yeah. 
But everyone just smiles and nods because that must be part of his plan. Mm -hmm. And then fairly early on, I believe, you find out that the essentially the alien sympathizers on Earth who have been communicating with the aliens through the Sophons have set up their kind of mirror organization of the wall breakers. But yeah. apparently the, the other side of that is that the, the aliens don't really understand deceit. As oh, a, as yes, a society. that's right. They, because they project their thoughts, essentially. Mm -hmm. So they don't have the uh, this this concept of a hidden agenda or lying is just foreign to them, which is the other reason why the wall facer plan seems like a good idea. <laughs> yes. But <laughs> and, then, of course, the alien sympathizers quickly teach them the ideas of deceit. <laughs> right. And they also designate individuals within the, the ETO are assigned to the different wall facers. The wall breakers are assigned to each one to basically study them, figure out their plan, and destroy their confidence. And, yeah, and, and reveal and, it. They don't and, have to do reveal, anything. They don't even have to stop it. They just have to reveal it because at that. Do point, you guys remember what the four or the three other wall facer plans were? I, I know they were oh, all. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Them. They were all violent, and they all required massive sacrifices. They were basically yeah. all self destructive. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, another really interesting thing is like the. The different mindsets uh, that people had towards the aliens because they they decided that defeatism was the worst possible. Oh, uh, right. Thing. And then escapism was also quickly banned of escapism is not an approach because it'll ruin yeah. everything for us. So, yeah. so Ryan, you're, you're starting to get into something that I think is just brilliant in this series. The, the scale in, in time particularly, that this story takes place, allows kind of society to be explored. And so not only do like individuals have different attitudes towards the aliens, certainly initially when we first learn of the aliens, but then as time progresses from there and things happen on Earth, attitudes shift, but society takes on different attitudes. And based on those attitudes, they act very differently. So yeah. something like the the Wallfacer project, we see humanity at, at completely different stages act with very different mindsets and therefore treating the Wallfacer project completely differently. Yeah, because one thing that's very important is that technologically is that hibernation is viable and presumably very safe because people do it pretty much on a whim. Yeah, and as we've just brought it up now, it, it is very matter of fact in the mm -hmm. book. It's just like, yeah. Yeah. Cryostasis exists. Yeah. And so I think uh, the character progression of Luoji is fantastic. He's he's basically this kind of like, I don't, they didn't really describe him as a like a savant, but someone who was very smart and who's just lazy. He was super smart and lazy and basically just didn't care about anything except himself mm -hmm. and... He was, uh, the, the first scene is telling he's, he's basically getting up from a one night stand and he doesn't even remember the name of the person he just slept with. Yes. And he's like that woman and she gets hit by a car, like right next to him. And he's like, oh, that sucks basically. And he can't even, he doesn't even know her name. Yeah. And so when the Wallfacer project is created, there's three very significant people. There's like an American military general. There's the guy from South America uh, who's like a... South American president. Yeah, like semi-benevolent dictator-ish. Mm, he was like an ex-guerrilla who's taken over the country. Yeah, yeah, revolutionary kind of guy. Who's the third one? I forget. Uh, a European is like a scientist maybe and a UN guy. Yeah, and yeah. And then the, the guerrilla. And then Luoji, and he's, like he's clearly Chinese outclassed. Science. He's like this Chinese scientist. Or but he's something. not remarkable. But yeah, he's well, just a guy. He's just no a one. Scientist. No one really knows why he got chosen. Yeah, and we don't know for a very long time. And it turns out, and I love this revelation in the book. It took me completely by surprise. He was chosen because the ETO and the Sophons and Trisolaris really wanted to kill him. Yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Which yeah, is yeah. what the car crash was. It was a mm -hmm. failed attempt at that. Failed assassination. Yeah. yeah. And no one knew why they wanted to kill him, but they figured if they wanted to kill the, him that bad, and they didn't care about the other three at all, really. They cared about exposing the plans, but they weren't. But if I remember correctly, the 
Trisolaris themselves didn't care that much. Mm-hmm. But they really cared about this guy, and so they gave, made him a wall facer just to, because it seemed like he knew what was going on. And he just gives up immediately and <laughs> demands this really luxurious uh, house out in the yeah. middle. What, of once Europe, once he figures out that he can't get out of it, he yeah. just uses the resources that he has to be utterly hedonistic. Yeah. Well, he like describes like who he wants his wife to be, and he's like, "Go find someone. <laughs> Go find this ideal woman for yeah. him." Yeah. And he lives in like this picturesque garden in like northern europe or something yeah i don't do they they never say it's, they never say where i think it's, it's kind of described scandinavian ish yeah that was the sense i got yeah, yeah. you know no road access they have to, like helicopter them in and in yeah. and out and then finally they get fed up right yeah he, he very quickly gets his money cut off and he's like i thought i had the resources of, of earth <laughs> yeah they're like no yeah they take away his wife and kid yeah it, 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 and we're talking about these things so quickly but these like the this is like the, the inter- first third of the book personal yeah the, and, and this is this is by far the most human of the books i think in this series and we well, certainly you know, get to know a lot more about him than any of the characters in the three body problem like yeah he does yeah. enough in the three body problem to make sense of yi wenji's decision but you don't get a whole lot about her and Luoji is really the first person you really get a good kind of character understanding of. Yeah, well, well, she, Yi Wenji was, a, you know, a scientist, and her motivations were, you know, primarily from the the, the Cultural Revolution stuff mm-hmm. early on. In the second book, I, I can't remember the protagonist's name. Luoji. Uh, he, you know, his motivations are are just far more everyday human. I think. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, he's putting put. put forcibly put in charge to solve a problem that he will never encounter like it's so far out in the future and he's just a random guy he doesn't know what's going on i thought his response was actually very sympathetic like i don't know how much effort i would have put into being a wall facer it seemed pretty hopeless it really taps into kind of a human selfishness that's relatable i think yeah what would you do if you had the un's resources behind you what would you do and no question to asked. stop an alien invasion in 400 years. And that you are the, and you have no idea how you're equipped to do it or and where to get yeah. what yeah, to and do. And you're not allowed to tell anyone what you're doing or why you're doing it. Yeah. It, it's, I thought it was very sympathetic. Anyways, yeah. what happens is he, f- there's this whole thing. Well, he talks to Yi Wenji. There's like a callback he does conversation. Talk. Yeah. He does talk to her. There, well, it's a flashback conversation. That's right. And they have a discussion at, is it her daughter's grave? or something i don't remember i think it might be her daughter's yes. grave she describes rem- probably my favorite concept in this whole series of what she gives them the basis for it what what she call it like uh is a galactic sociology or something like that something like that yeah and it basically the idea is can you use math to model the interactions between galactic civilizations and there there's two tenants one uh there's two tenants and then two ideas axioms yeah it's like civilizations will be selfish well they they will always try to survive yeah and there are limited resources and there are limited resources yeah and then the two concepts are technical technological explosions Mm -hmm. and chains of suspicion right so technological explosions being almost like a that's um What's his face's paradigm shift idea, right? Karl Popper. Popper. That's it. Great. The chain of suspicion is essentially that because you're so far apart. Because you're so far apart, any communication exposes your location very easily, and so there's not enough communication ability to communicate that you're not a threat without exposing yourself to, to the other side. Mistrust. Yeah. Yeah. To overcome that that mistrust. Right. Yeah. Um, so everyone wants to survive. There's not enough resources. You can't ever establish trust with anyone else because you're too far away. And because of the time lapse, you can't observe people at the same time. You know, right. there's, there's some lapse. So you can't know their um, own technological. So exactly. Yeah. And observing the history of different races, you know that they'll suddenly go from, you know, farming to the industrial age or, you know, yeah. atomic age to whatever is next (laughs) and they talk about this in the first book a little bit of 
the Trisolarans worry about Earth overtaking their technology, which is why they send the Sophons in the first place. But the idea is that if you find another civilization out there, they could very quickly overtake your technology and destroy you. Mm-hmm. So the only, or maybe not the only, but the most logical move is to preemptively destroy anyone else you find. Yes. And that is where you get the Dark Forest yes. analogy of all these civilizations are hunters silently creeping through a dark forest. And if anyone ever shows a light or makes a noise, they get shot by everyone else. Not um, even by the party they're like communicating with, like just someone. Someone will see them and shoot them. Yeah. Because it, it as a preemptive strike. Yeah. It Which, also it also neatly solves the uh, Fermi, Fermi paradox. paradox. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of a dour outlook on it, but it is at least kind of makes sense. It, yeah. It's a cohesive approach to it, I think. Yeah. And the way they discover it is so cool because finally after they kind of force him to think about it. Yeah. Luoji, he shoots out the coordinates of this random star. Well, he fi- he figures it out yeah. and then he tells them I'm going to cast a spell on this system on this star, yeah. far away. And all the enthusiasm for the Wallfacer project has fallen apart at this point. Yeah. Because the other two have gone insane and the third guy is in stasis for the foreseeable future. Right. And so he says, I'm going to cast a spell and destroy this system 50 light years away. And they're like, sure, <laughs> yeah. go for it. You buddy. do you. <laughs> and then he gets, then he goes into hibernation. So he basically uses the same sun super antenna technique to send out coordinates of this star and just blast it out. And the idea is that other civilizations are out there listening. They will hear this and see the tech, they see the location. And they might not even see any technology there, mm-hmm. but someone will just destroy the destroy the system. Yeah, as just preemptively, don't take the risk, just destroy it. And then he goes into hibernation for two hundred years. And then he wakes up, and no one's ever heard of the Wallfacer Project. No one even knows who he is, really. Yeah, no one knows it at all. Like that's not even like in history books. Yeah. Which oh, it's another thing again where something well in that in this case simultaneously incredibly important and not important at all. Yeah. <laughs> like what he does is important. The rest of the project, which at the beginning of the book seems like humanity's last hope, just yeah. kind of fades away into history. Right. Yeah. And, th- and that's one of those incredible shifts of societal mood where, you know, we kind of learn the history of what Earth has gone through, which has been very rough. But through that, society has latched onto very different ideals. And, and I think when he wakes up, society is fruitful again and everything is as good as it's ever been and they've gone through rough times and that's taught them to just not worry about the distant future um yeah and, so and then society they also and, and for, making... furthermore society deals with the alien threat coming coming through a rough period and then becoming successful again they deal with it by basically changing how they think about it like all their philosophy basically tells them like Oh, those ancients were wrong. Like these aliens that are coming were stronger than them and they're probably peaceful anyway. Yeah, it's it's such a fascinating sociological shift where he wakes up and it's really described as like humanity has become more feminized. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. And, and literally like looking. all the men of the era are more feminine. Right. And I've heard this criticized as being misogynist somehow. I don't see it that way. I see it as humanity has become incredibly, yeah, I guess short-sighted. You know, their, their time preference has shrunk. Where And they also, ha- they have made advances. Like, they have, oh, yeah, technological. They have spaceships that can get around the solar system uh, trivially. Mm-hmm. And they've got mining set up on multiple planets and bases and all this sort of stuff. And they're like, we've advanced so much, clearly we're superior now. And it becomes this... I don't know. It's it's a golden era in the age of the yeah. perspective, and everyone is just I don't know. Everyone's happy. <laughs> yeah, combined with kind of a a collection of like mega governments that are very focused on projecting their own power mm-hmm. and like almost like power theater, right? And so the governments of of the world of Earth are trying to make everyone feel very complacent and happy and and not worry about the future. Mm-hmm. And they're just trying to, you know, build the coolest ships and bickering amongst themselves. It's a very, I think it's a very sharp satire. That whole sequence in the underground bunkers. 
underground civilization Mm -hmm. of just complacency on complacency that you'll just live your life and then die and not worry about future generations and the just (laughs) generational hubris (laughs) yeah yeah you know the satire is most blisteringly seen when finally a probe shows up yeah finally one of the probes shows up and you get just the spectacular droplet scene yeah so this yeah it, this probe so, is so this... humanity is saying at this point we are far superior we can handle anything the aliens show up with which is also like a clearly ridiculous notion based on what you know of trisolars's technology how fast they can move like that's a pretty good barometer of technology right how fast can you pro- propel a ship and they're already you know, we haven't reached that from what I can remember in the book or come close to that kind of thing. We haven't been able to fold a nano computer, right? Like, yeah. touch screens have gotten really good. <laughs> they had some sort of radiation drive that would let yeah. them get around the solar system in. Yeah, like, in days the time since the first book, humanity is able to basically reach the limits of present day science. Yeah, so basically right. computers got really fast and then some improved propulsion. Yeah. Yeah. So nothing fundamentally of our understanding of the universe has changed. They have really good rail guns, <laughs> things like yeah. that. But yeah, but imagine like technology that we have today taken out to the literal extreme. Well, no, it was cool because they're like showing him around and like the cool shiny thing is that basically that everything's a touchscreen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. Literally, oh, yeah. Literally, this is even your clothes. Every surface is a touchscreen. It's like, all right. <laughs> yeah, what does that say about our society? Yeah. And then, and then it's got, like, the targeted advertisements following oh, them around yeah. all the constantly. And then there's, like, the dead virus, killer virus that comes after him and starts breaking everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, like, set up after he was in hibernation and it was, it came out and, like, basically just hacking its way through all the touch screens around him. And breaking things to try to kill him. And the police are like, no, 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 that never happened. There hasn't been a murder in 40 years. Right. And then, yeah. like, the fourth time in one day, he almost dies. And then, and I think someone else maybe dies. Or the robot, like, literally attacks him. The robot server. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, it's this super virus that's been dormant for 50 years. Sorry. <laughs> was this, I can't remember if this was the second or third book where Trisolaris had kind of figured out how to make really riveting movies third that was in the third book yeah okay. yeah a lot of the things we're talking about get taken further in the third book yeah uh in, in really fascinating ways anyways so anyways, wants to describe the droplet the this this probe shows up and uh it's it's engine shut off so they can't track it by its emissions anymore so they basically send out all this uh some sort of fine gas cloud to be able to have a a trace of it so that they can see it coming in and there's this attitude of like we're going to welcome them to the solar system and establish these great diplomatic ties and everything so they fly out every single (laughs) ship in the interstellar fleet remember because they can't they can't come to an agreement on which fleet will go out (laughs) yeah so they send every single ship they have and they park like a meter away from each other in space like somewhere out past Saturn or whatever. No, right? Not a meter. They were, they okay. were they thousands were... of kilometers apart, but relatively speaking, Com- close. Okay. If if they were a standing army, they would be, they would have been shoulder to shoulder. Yes, on a on a solar level. On yeah. A, the the point is they were just packed in super tight, and so then they send out kind of the science ship to go look at the probe, and it's just kind of like floating there, and they grab it and look at it, and then they try to examine the surface. And it's this incredibly smooth, almost mirror-like surface. And then they microscope in, and it's still the same perfection. And they microscope in another thousand times, and it's still the same. And then they hit it with a pickaxe as hard as they can, or a laser or something, and like. Well, they read that it's it's zero Kelvin. And they also realize that it's absolute zero, and they're like, "Oh, this is beyond anything we've ever seen." (laughs) Yeah, it's literally an object made of atoms that aren't moving. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's it's, it's so it's like, a strong, it's strong yeah interaction strong. substance yeah um what does which that mean, Matt? again is uh, again is like it's kind of this way out there 
technology that doesn't sound like anywhere close to reality, but is kind of theoretically possible. Is it basically that you're using like the strong nuclear force to pack atom or pack nuclei together to be the most solid thing you could imagine? Yeah, yeah. So okay. it's almost like it's one giant atom, like a surface right, composed of one well, atom. If, if you fuse of, protons and neutrons together to just think, make one substrate. What we think of as solid is actually like 99.99% empty space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like the Bohr is, model. Is, like you can shoot right. thousands of specks through an atom and only one of them deflects. Right. Because the, the nucleus is so small relative to the orbits of the electrons mm-hmm. um, and electrons are minuscule as they are but if you just packed all of those nuclei together you'd get something insane <laughs> and basically so, it's incredibly dense <laughs> incredibly dense yeah yeah and then the probe wakes up and starts just ramming all of the ships because they are so close and it's just blasting through them blowing them up not only is it can it just do that but it also has a propulsion system where it can just like turn at right angles yeah um <laughs> it it can turn on a dime <laughs> yeah at while it's going 100 meters a second 100 oh, very fast kilometers per second or something yeah i don't know so it just rams through the ships the whole front rank of the the fleet blows up before anyone realizes what's happening they start panicking and run into each other and try <laughs> to all run in the different directions but they haven't engaged their inertial dampeners to actually accelerate so they're all like slowly moving apart and it's just picking them off and ramming all of them. And it, it yeah. wipes out the entire fleet except for like three ships. Two ships. Right? Yeah, it, in it all two? along, like, I think it's two. Like they can't conceive of this happening because right. the it's kind and, of the mindset of humanity see. is just so out of touch with what the re- reality of this alien force is. So then the whole fleet is just instantly wiped out. And again, it takes, you know, a couple, min, several minutes for it to for that news to get back to Earth, mm-hmm. and then the the droplet, as it's called, flies into the the Lagrange point oh, and yeah. basically starts broadcasting white noise at the sun to block out block it out as from being used as an antenna, like um, mm-hmm. first Yi initially in the three body problem, and then Luoji again when he cast his spell. Yes. Which we didn't mention, but did the star did blow up? <laughs> I think yes. after the disaster, which becomes apparent notice, like eighty oh, years they later, look at, they finally they, look. They finally it's just look gone, and the system is again gone. long after anybody cares on yeah. Earth. <laughs> and explain I, the Lagrange point because I had to look this up. It's like the gravitational mid point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between yeah. Two in, bodies, in a I solar think. system, it's a point where kind of gravitational gravitational forces balance out, so you can kind of be stationary relative to another body. So then there's just panic on Earth. It's starting to devolve into chaos. People are rioting and looting, and no one has known trouble in a generation and doesn't know how to handle it. And so, like, the people that chose to live on the surface because they were these, like, hardy farmers start getting overrun with all the, the soft city dwellers from under the surface, and so they move farther out. And then at some point in all of this, like a day or two later, they grab Luoji and say, hey, you're in charge again as a wall facer because we just looked and that system you cast a spell on has been destroyed. (laughs) Yes. And then long story short, we get to the concluding scene, which is, I loved it so much. Essentially, as part of the wall facer project, he sets up this kind of series of nuclear devices outside of Earth. It's cloaked as saying, we want some sort of early defense to be able to tell where and when the Trisolar's fleet enters the solar system. So we're going to set up all of these gas bombs to spread particulate throughout the solar system. So it'll leave a little trail. So that trail. there's a trail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he basically plays the part of this depressed, given up, broken down guy who's just like, well, this is the last thing I have going for me. And basically no one pays attention to him. Yeah, but he's. I think he is all of those things, but he's also doing an act. (laughs) Yeah, true. But he's also doing work. This ring of these devices, and it's basically designed to flash and, or not flash, but block out enough of the sun's emissions so that it essentially acts as a star chart. 
to a suitably advanced civilization that is looking, mm-hmm. which gives away the location of the Trisolaris, which is Alpha Centauri, if no one had guessed that, and which basically guarantees that the Trisolarian fleet would be destroyed. And so it's this crazy nuclear deterrent. Yeah. <laughs> ultimate well, deterrent. Well, and also the f- mutual destruction. He knows that once they find Trisolaris, they'll be very easy to fight Earth. Right, because there is evidence of their transmissions back and forth, Mm -hmm. you know, separated by four years. So if you find one, you know there's someone at the other. Yeah, Uh, and he sets up a a classic just dead man's uh, switch and uh, threatens to shoot himself and starts yelling at the air. (laughs) And and basically faces down the Trislarans and they surrender and say well all right we'll leave you alone and well, no, we'll leave you alone they they lift the tech block that and they also agree to start sharing technology yeah is now a good time for me to bring up my gripes about the second book well is sure. one of them the closing scene because if so we'll have to kick you off this call and right we'll, we'll have to fight <laughs> 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 no um no as you described the dead man switch orion uh and mark which makes Makes a lot of sense. I think, so the whole Wallfacer idea, which is really central to the narrative of the second book, basically all the Wallfacers end up having very similar ideas that play out kind of really just at different times. And one of the things that I I was a little disappointed in was that basically the main character's plan came down to a dead man switch, which... Sorry, actually, the dead man switch isn't the main point. The main point is that mutual destruction would happen. You would have preferred so it, a, a less drastic solution? It's not that I have a problem with that. It's a, it's that I, I thought I felt like thematically it was kind of dismissing that um, because the first two wall facers, I think, that end up being obvious and their plans are revealed. They basically had mutual destruction plans but they get found out and they go crazy and, 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 and get removed their wall breakers were successful yeah the, the one um, guy was gonna try to hide a bunch of bombs and basically surrender and betray earth and then try to kamikaze into the trislaris fleet right yeah so yeah like that. yeah and, and the other he, one was the basically was blowing up mercury put, to put a bunch of bombs on one system. side of mercury and blow it into the sun to cause a cascading supernova <laughs> Yeah. Um, not, not only do kind of the suspension of the of disbeliefs become harder in, in some of these plans, which is fine, but I don't think it's as tight as the first book. Kind of narratively, I, I ended up being kind of disappointed with where they ultimately took that final scene of we're just back to mutual destruction. I completely disagree, actually. I think the rejection of the or the, the, the kind of aghast horror at the revelation of the first couple wallfacer ideas is just commenting on society and it's again a situation where earth didn't quite understand the stakes or humanity didn't quite understand the stakes where all of a sudden the context has changed so much and we know we we understand now the threat so much more that these really awful horrible things need to happen if we want to have a chance of survival. And I think, especially yeah, when you look at yeah. the third book, I, no, uh, no, in no, context I, I think you're with right, Mark. And, and I think it's fine. And really, this is a minor gripe, because I think that all three of these books are absolutely phenomenal. It's just, I didn't find this book as thematically tight, because ultimately it just kind of circles back, and, it, and I don't think it does so all that cleanly. But I don't know. Well, I think it's saying something about different perspective, almost different psychological perspectives on addressing crises where, and you'll see this continue yeah. a lot in the third book where it portrays like the masculine reaction, which is violent and pragmatic and very, very blunt against the kind of feminine response, which in many cases is loving and self-destructive self-destructive in a sense of like allowing bad things to happen but retaining some nature of humanity or morality which is ultimately where the third book gets to sure and so i think 
the contrast that's where the, this that kind of contrast is teased out in the dark forest where you have you know where, where earth has to if it wants to survive has to resort back to the violent dirty solution pragmatic solution yeah 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 i guess ultimately i'm i'm really just saying i think i think the second book i found at the end feeling like a lot of the narration was unnecessary because we kind of went through this the same cycles where I, I didn't feel like we were really adding something new or different in each cycle. Basically, we just set up the same thing a couple of times. Um, and then at the end, we very quickly reverted back to where we started with mutually, you know, mutual destruction. Yeah, I understand it. I just yeah, it. yeah, it, 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 it works and it, it, it's it's good. I think uh, really, really all I'm trying to say is I, I, I don't think the second book is as narratively tight as the first book. That's fair, but wrong. <laughs> I think for me, it just the the cosmic sociology and the dark forest is that idea and the implication of that just grabbed me so much and how they kind of get there and yeah, the implications absolutely. and the decisions people make in these horrible situations. Yeah, we, and we Which haven't even love. touched on the miniature dark forest that happens in that in that droplet bat- battle that you described earlier, Ryan. A couple ships ex- escape. One of the main characters actually kind of escapes with with some of the fleet, and they run into their own dark forest situation where there are three ships without enough resources, and they end up mutually destroying each well, other. N- one of them shoots first. Basically, they're yeah. all ready to shoot, but one of them happens to shoot first and kills the other two ships and takes, you know, sets, sets, strips them for resources and goes on their way. Mm-hmm. And it, it's just yeah. like this triple whammy at the end of like, first you have the droplet and you're like, all of humanity, triumphalism and hubris is just exposed and everything is, you know, everything is doomed. And then the few escapees have this horrible you know cannibalistic art battle of darkness and then i think you finally get the dark forest revelation like it's in the last 20 pages or something Maybe oh yeah quite 20 but it's real last, late really really close to the end and then you're just like oh wow there's no friends out there everyone is trying to kill everyone else there's no hope for community in the galaxy you're so alone and you have to hide and then you get this tiny little like the only way to survive is mutual destruction in this, you know, in this case and this deterrence situation. I don't know. I, I think that just carries the book so much for me. Yeah, I think ultimately the reason I prefer this one by a hair over the other two is that when we've mentioned this word before, it feels so much more cinematic. Like certainly Death's End yeah. is bigger and it could certainly whenever they make it can be kind of like the 2001 trippy, crazy sci fi stuff in many ways, but as like a cohesive story and narrative and really compelling scenes and interesting characters, like this one felt much more, I don't know, like, like my mind's, you know, my mind's movie projector was activated a lot more clearly in this one. That makes any sense. You know, you read and you're like imagining visually everything that's going on. I can remember those visuals of my imagination of the dark forest much clearer than the other two. The cinematics of the second are are probably the the most impressive. I think the third book has some amazing some cinematic scenes as well. But the um, second book is the most you said um, flowery earlier. Just in, in the language, the translation in the language. A lot of the very human scenes that we get in this book are just kind of I I don't know if quaint's the right word flowery descriptions of just romance kind mm-hmm. of yeah which works so well uh within these incredibly cosmic scales yeah it has that contrast really nicely where yeah. huge scale but also a lot of very individual human s- stuff yeah i think we'll leave it there for the the dark forest uh thanks for listening everybody don't forget to check out the thoughtfulgamer.com if you want to watch our main podcast being recorded live and you want to join our Discord, or just want to help support us in our podcasting and writing ways, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. 
Also, don't forget to rate and review this podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.